I'm Mary Evelyn Tucker. I teach at Yale at the School of the Environment and the Divinity School and Religious Studies in a joint program on world religions and ecology that was started about 15 years ago by our former Dean, Gus Spett. And I also head up with my husband, the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale, which is the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology is a project that began 25 years ago at Harvard, surveying the world's religions for their views of nature and environmental ethics. It's now based at Yale, and the URL is for, F-O-R-E, dot Yale, dot E-D-U. There are many, many resources there, statements on the world's religions, bibliography, engaged projects. We invite you to uh, use them, enjoy them, and also subscribe to the newsletter of the forum. I would say that my spiritual and moral philosophy comes deeply from Teilhard de Chardin, the Jesuit paleontologist who had a vision of the unfolding universe and the role of the human in it. That was picked up by Thomas Berry, a cultural historian who also studied the world's religions. And he took that idea of evolution as a context for all of human action um, as a new story for our times. And that is what has really informed uh, our work, our Journey of the Universe film, and the work of the Forum on Religion and Ecology. Because to say in simplest terms, we all know that we need a new story that's going to animate people. Um, and both Teilhard and Thomas were concerned about generating human action for change, for transformation, for an equitable and flourishing Earth community. Teilhard in particular between the two world wars was concerned about the existentialism and malaise of Europe uh, without a sense of purpose and meaning. And the same in our times, there's tremendous de depression and despair, but with a sense of a new story that brings us together with all of our differences, I think hope can be generated along with the best of the wisdom traditions uh, that we have to share around the planet. That's my greatest hope, a new story and wisdom from the world's religions for an ecological and just future. I think what's especially needed in a time of climate emergency, of ecological breakdown, is a new sense of environmental ethics and human social justice ethics. These are coming together in a whole range of new ways in eco-justice, which is the theme of this conference and so critical. Now, why is that important? I teach at one of the oldest schools of the environment in the country, Yale School of the Environment. Um, but that is a school for 120 years that has led in the science and policy of environmental understanding of the latest in climate science, in pollution areas, and so on, in biodiversity loss. But the human hasn't always been central to these kinds of studies. And that's true in most of the sciences. Now we are realizing that human attitudes, human values, human behaviors need to be included in the solutions that we're looking for. We have a lot of data on the environmental problems, including climate change. Um, we have all kinds of reports and statistics and so on. We still don't have the moral will and certainly the political intelligence to move forward. So how we activate humans on this issue um, for the justice issues for both people and planet is critical. Let me say one of the best examples of this is Laudato Si, the encyclical from Pope Francis that came out in 2015. Now, this is critical because until that time, there was not a statement available on a worldwide level appealing to both two billion Christians, but to all the world's religions that responded to this encyclical with great enthusiasm. <clears throat> the force of that encyclical comes in this phrase, cry of the earth, cry of the poor. And that comes out of Leonardo Boff, one of the leading liberation theologians in Latin America from Brazil. And he wrote a book in 1997 saying, 
with that title um, that we need to assure the integrity of ecosystems and justice for humans. He was influenced largely by Thomas Berry, who said, Leonardo, we can't liberate humans without uh, ensuring ecosystems for the flourishing of people, food, water, air, the planet itself. <clears throat> so that central idea in La Data Si, this encyclical, praise be, praise be all uh, of earth and planetary creatures, um, needs to have this conjunction of people and planet. That is, I think, a source of tremendous hope for us. And the Pope is going to do a new encyclical being released on October 3rd and 4th for the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi. In Assisi, he will say a mass there and release a new encyclical, which will celebrate fraternity, the fraternity of all people. And that sense of kinship, not only with people, but with other species, with a living earth community is also central for moving forward. We've got to connect the dots. This is a living earth. This isn't a dead earth. And we have no right to exploit it to such a degree as we have. So these documents, I think, among many others, new theologies emerging from the different world's religions, new ethics, new sense of uh, nature religions, reclaiming the sensibilities of this living earth, and certainly the voices of indigenous peoples um, on these issues are absolutely critical. So those are some of the areas I think we can all pick up on for the future of our planet and its people and its species. There are so many concrete actions that we are all observing and helping to midwife around the planet. The Forum on Religion and Ecology has identified engaged projects of all the world's religions, and they are there to see with URLs. And these range from tree planting, uh, Buddhist monks in Southeast Asia who are ordaining trees and protecting them, tree planting of around Hindu uh, temples uh, where the, the offering of a tree is a prasad, a gift uh, for the temple and reforestation and so on. The Chipko movement that inspired so many people in the Himalaya region started by women uh, with this notion of Shakti, the life principle, uh, saving trees and reforesting and so on. The protection of rivers is all over the planet. Um, the key river in New Zealand has been protected by the Maori and now has its own rights. This rights of nature idea um, is evident in uh, this river in New Zealand and in several places around the world. Uh, the rivers of India, there's all kinds of efforts for the Yamuna and Ganges to clean them up because they are sacred rivers and so on. I could go on and on, and certainly we can refer to indigenous peoples, the Standing Rock Movement, where water is sacred was the key phrase. This whole idea of the sacredness of all the elements of nature, of forests, of rivers, of land, of animals, of birds, again, indigenous peoples, but many of the world's religions had this sensibility. Buddhism with its awesome notion of interconnectedness, of interbeing, um, would suggest, especially in its East Asian forms, that all life forms are sentient, are living, and therefore should be protected, and so on. Now, I want to underscore that the world's religions have great teachings, have immense wisdom and spiritual insight. They have not always lived up to these aspirations. And so that's the invitation of a conference like this on e eco-justice, calling on these, these voices uh, embedded in peoples and projects and institutions around the world to midwife the teachings into their new phases. We like to say we retrieve ideas and teachings and practices, we reevaluate them in modern circumstances, and we reconstruct them, construct them for the present. That's been done for women's issues, uh, especially in the world's religions. We have a long way to go on that. But now we're also doing it for the ecological issues and marrying them with the justice issues. That's the great opportunity here. 
Religions have their problems and they have their promise. So we want to say with all the imperfections, uh, with, with all the, the problems that religions have created historically and at present, they are still one of the last great resources at our present moment for true transformation, for long-term change, for efficacious partnership, both of humans and nature for the flourishing of the planet. I would love to share a saying from Chang Sai, an 11th century Neo-Confucian thinker in China. This is one of the most famous phrases of all Confucian thought, and indeed in the world's wisdom traditions. It's singular. It's called the Western inscription because Chang Sai had it on his Western wall of his study. Heaven is my father and earth is my mother, and even such a small creature as I finds a place in their midst. Therefore, that which extends throughout the universe I regard as my body, and that which directs the universe I regard as my nature. All people are my brothers and sisters, and all things are my companions. Even those who are tired and infirm, crippled or sick, those who have no brothers or sisters, wives or husbands, all are my brothers who are in distress and have no one to turn to. This sense of human solidarity is something we can aspire to. And the Confucian tradition also took this to the living earth community, that the fecundity of the earth with its great transformations is something that we can harmonize with and be inspired by, with the seasons, the directions, the colors, the animal world, the bird world. Everything was to be in harmony in the Confucian tradition. This is one of the great, great philosophical and religious traditions that we can draw on. Uh, the Chinese are in what's called ecological civilization. So this particular inscription, the Western inscription of Chang Sai, uh, is something I recommend to all of us. You know, the notion of the earth as alive is a very ancient one in the human community. Indigenous peoples have it for millennia. The nature religions, the nature writers, the romantic poets certainly are well aware of it. All of us as humans have this experience at a sunrise or a sunset in the midst of the stillness of a forest or swimming on a beautiful lake. We have an experience of something that's larger than ourselves and yet present to ourselves. This experience of what we dwell amidst, something great and something present, something magnificent cosmic and something near and touching. This is the source of the wisdom traditions that we live amidst. How we name this and how we put that dynamic sense of cosmos and earth together is our greatest challenge right now. And it's true that sometimes we make for a transcendence above the earth something separate from a divine force or reality not connected to the earth. And that could be a stumbling block if we stop there. Because we have all kinds of language now to relate that divine force to the forces in nature itself. And that is the deep invitation of the human spirit. This sense, which some would call creator and creation. Others would call the power of heaven and the power of earth. Hindus would call it Brahman and Atma. These dynamic pulsating interactions are not dualistic, are not separate. They're complementary. They're joining now in our times as almost never before. And let me just say why I have been so inspired by Teilhard de Chardin, because he felt that this whole unfolding universe 
had spirit and matter right at the heart, right from the beginning of the great flaring forth. And that sense of an inner energy of reality is something that we sense in the stars, in the galaxies, in the cosmos, and all the way down to Earth systems, from the roaring forth of life systems here, the geological time, plate tectonics, of all of the expressions of life, we have known and preceded us. There's an energy within matter that's spiritual, that's dynamic, that we can relate to. And that is one of the most important ways forward because that will lead to the true transformation of humans within a living earth community. We're all looking for the immediate answer to solve climate change, but we know it's structural. It's very complicated. Human action is important, but so are changes of structures. But we can do many things. We can eat less meat. <laughs> and that is a huge change in our choices of food uh, for a better future for our planet. We can change what we buy, what we drive, how we go about life and the health of people and planet. So, you know, one thing would be certainly eat less meat.